Hey. Good to see you, man. How are you? Good to see you, Good. too. So, Dr. David Sarku, head yeah. neck surgeon, facial plastic <laughs> surgeon extraordinaire in, Ch mm -hmm. in Chicago, right? In the Chicago area. Which right. exact region are you in there? Uh, I'm in the western suburbs in Aurora. Okay. Okay, cool. So, yeah. So, for those who may not know, Dave and I trained together in the greatest Dude. hospital on the planet, <laughs> in Philadelphia. In good old days. And yep. uh, we're definitely happy yeah. to be uh, in our hometowns, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to be back. The, the Temple Dream Team. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, this has been like an interesting format, you know, Instagram Live. It's kind of like a, a newer thing. But mm -hmm. it's nice because the videos, they don't, they don't like disappear forever. Nowadays, actually, right. they go into like the IGTV. So they kind of stay on online on the feed. And then I've been working on getting them to YouTube as well. So it's going to be useful content that, you know, will be out there for people to find and to search for. So, you know, so hopefully it helps some, some folks. I think having these kind of casual discussions with people who know what they're talking about is is a useful thing, you know, because how else are patients going to find out about it other, like, other than like coming and meeting us or meeting many specialists this way they can just kind of capture some good information. Yeah, that's you know, good. They don't start from ground zero, then they kind of an idea of what to what to look for. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like some of the videos that are already on YouTube, like I've had some nice comments, um, you know, like this was really helpful to me and like making decisions for surgery. So yeah, so cool. So let's, uh, let's jump right into it. So let's just t start with like what, you know, makes for like a good looking ear, like in terms of proportions, you know, some people, you know, they may think that they have an issue, but then in reality, they don't or vice versa. So right. like, how, do, how do people assess, you know, if they need some, uh, some of our help? <laughs> well, you know, that's a good question in the sense that, you know, I think it does individualize or is individual to every person. So there's certainly textbook things we look at. So you know, the average male ear is about six centimeters in height and about three and a half centimeters in width. And, you know, females a little bit smaller, about 5.9 centimeters in height. And, you know, if you look at textbook, you know, you look at how far the ear protrudes out from the scalp. So ideally it's about a 20 to, to 30 degree angle. Um, you know, you look at, um, you know, the, what we call the mastoid angle, the angle it makes with the mastoid to about 90 degrees. But, you know, that being said, if you go from person to person, everyone has kind of their own taste. So, you know, there's also a cultural aspect to it. So in some Asian cultures, for example, having ears that are prominent that kind of stick out is actually considered to bring good luck. And so actually otoplasty or changing the appearance of the ear um, is actually not done as much in, in some Asian cultures because actually they, they want their ears to, to be more prominent. Whereas in Western civilization, it's kind of not as, as socially acceptable and there's kind of a stigma associated with it. And so, so to some extent, there's, there's certainly a, a personal aspect to it as far as what people kind of like or don't like. So we certainly have these kind of textbook numbers we'll look at, but, you know, part of it is if it bothers someone, you know, I have a lot of this actually is done in kids because a lot of parents will come in, you know, with concerns, especially before kids get to, you know, to go to school. And so it really comes down to personal concern regarding the appearance as well as, you know, when you then evaluate them, if there is something and you feel that you can potentially help them to, to improve that with. Yeah, no, that's all excellent points. Um, what are your thoughts on when patients come in and they say, well, one ear sticks out more than the other and, you know, they want them to be perfectly symmetric. You know, do you think that that's something that, that they should want to have done or do you think it's possible or do you just tell them they're always going to be a little different? Uh, yeah, perfect symmetry is probably the, the hardest thing to achieve. And actually, there was a good study looking at some rhinoplasty patients and facial aesthetic patients, and they found that about 97% of people have little facial asymmetries if you really look analytically. So it's actually the very little minority of people that, that have. And, you know, one, for example, one celebrity that has Shania Twain, if you actually take her face and split it down the middle and superimpose them, she actually is perfectly symmetric. But there's there's a lot of people that we consider to be, quote unquote, attractive who who are not symmetric. And actually that's, that's really the human condition is, is the imperfection. And so, you know, I always tell my patients, you know, if your goal really is to get, you know, I have to be this way or I'm not going to be happy or it has to have perfect symmetry, then, you know, probably going through an operation is not the right thing to do for any operation, let alone, you know, ears, which, which are tough because there's a lot, what you see on the table and what you see even post-operatively is really not going to be your final result. Uh, much like rhinoplasty, it takes, really a full year to kind of settle in and there's little changes that will happen. And so, 
you know, there's, you try to plan for those things, certainly, but, you know, if someone is, is really, you know, needs to have it a certain way, then, you know, they probably would not be happy at the end of the day. And it may not be worth going through an operation like that or, or procedure, you know, for that. Right. No, good point. Yeah, I find that it's not only like how much the ear sticks out, but also the, the tilt of the ear can be different right. from one side to the other. And that's not something easily correctable with surgery, right? Right. And it kind of gets away, you know, the one thing, especially with a lot of the procedures that, that I do, we try to do, you know, at least for me, I really want it to be a natural look. So if, unless you tell people that you're going to have the procedure done, I don't want people to know necessarily that they've had a procedure done. And so when you try to correct those, like the angle of the ear, or, you know, trying to get things perfectly symmetric, that's when things start to look kind of odd, like something's off. And that's when people start to notice that, you know, something's not right. Maybe we've had something done. Right. And so it just doesn't look natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, so let's chat about ear lobes. So one of the biggest complaints I think that we see with ears uh, is that like people, I guess, wear their earrings and then it rips through and they have kind of an opening there or a complete tear and they come in wanting it fixed. So what are your thoughts on, I guess, most common things that cause it to rip open uh, and also like you know, we've talked about this sort of off the air uh, mm -hmm. about like different challenges of fixing like different types of earlobe tears and, um, and the complexities that could be involved. But, you know, I guess, how do you kind of like picture it in your mind about like the different types of it, what causes it and how you fit, go about fixing it? Yeah, the, the most common causes I see are, are usually trauma related. So oftentimes it's people with young kids that will reach up, especially with hoop earrings and will... Mm -hmm yank on them and, and, you know, have them kind of rip through. Yeah. Um, you know, as I think people that tend to wear heavier earrings um, just over time, just, just cause of gravity, unfortunately gravity kind of pulls down and weighs down and will over time tend to elongate the, the earlobe and sometimes will tear through. And so, you know, those are probably the most common reasons that, that I'll see people come in or at least the most common inciting factors. Um, you know, fortunately as we, as we get older, we tend to lose volume and, and in all of our skin and the skin doesn't have as much elasticity. And so those factors, I think, play a role too over time, you know, they will tend to tear through, you know, the repair, you know, there's lots of different ways that, that people repair. There's just all these complicated it flaps and things like that. You know, truly I found actually kind of simple is, is better. And so if you can re, you know, reapproximate it, put it back together and, and use some careful suturing techniques, um, you know, I find that that often tends to work the best. And one of the keys is when you go to eventually re-pierce the ear, try not to put the piercing directly where it was before, because, you know, in the best of cases, scar tissue has about 80% of the strength of normal tissue. And so it, it's always going to be weaker in that spot than, right. you know, an area that hasn't torn. So even putting it a millimeter or two off to either side or in the exact same area um, also helps. Okay. And then how long would you wait before re-piercing the ear after the repair? Usually I wait a minimum of six weeks. Um, you, know, you can certainly wait longer, but but usually six weeks is enough time to at least get the, you know, the initial uh, collagen you know, conversion and some strength into the wound. Where, and then you suggest um, placing it in, the, in an area maybe adjacent to where the previous hole was? Yeah, to minimize the chance of it kind of tearing through again, especially if they're going to wear, they're going to continue to wear heavier earrings. You know, it's great if they, you know, we're just studs and stuff to kind of minimize the chance, but uh, so they're going to wear heavier earrings, and definitely I'd recommend your piercing in a different area. So just like to touch on technique a little bit, you know, I've had patients come in and they think that you literally just suture from one side to the other. And mm -hmm. that's what they were told by certain other providers. And they kind of had a feeling that that was not how it's done. So mm -hmm. I guess just to kind of harp on this a little bit, I mean, like when I do it, you know, we try to remove the inner skin so that... Right the um, areas kind of come, come together. Do you ever see it done in any uh, other way or that's really the only real way to repair it, right? That's kind of how, at least for me, that's how I start mine. I mean, there's papers I've seen, uh, there's a paper by Reagan Thomas where he does a, a square flap. He cuts a little square and he advances the, the lobule back in and kind of does almost like a Z-plasty type of closure. And it works. I mean, a lot of these, there's not a, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, you know, so to speak. But, you know, I found kind of more complicated to make things, you kind of start to distort some of the earlobe. And more importantly, when you make more incisions, you make more scar tissue, which again is never going to be as strong as, yeah. as a natural tissue. And so 
if you can. Now it's different if you're doing something like like for people that wear ear gauges, for example, where they've really stretched out their ear and they have all this excess skin. You know, that's a little different situation. But for traumatic tears or people that have had earrings kind of come through, you know, freshening the skin. And then what I found to be actually the most important is really getting, you know, I know it's a kind of a basic surgical principle, but having no tension on the wound. So for me, mm-hmm. I'll do a lot of what's called vertical mattress sutures, which are special sutures basically just to take kind of all tension off the, I'll do a bunch of interrupted vertical mattress. And then I also do a really small a running stitch down. And I found that actually the scar to be pretty much imperceptible, you know, once yeah. it kind of fully heals up. And so just kind of using good surgical principles, I found for that usually, usually works pretty well. For your vertical mattress, do you do far, far, near, near, or do you go near, near, far, far? I do uh, usually near, near, and then I use that to, to lift up and then I do my, right. my far, far, because you know, the most important thing is really getting the good approximation, especially close. I want to make sure the skin edges are hopefully as perfectly aligned as I can. And so doing near and near for me uh, tends to, to get that done. Do you ever find that cutting out those really small sutures uh, with, that were placed vertical mattress to be challenging at all? Like yeah, leaving any, any suturing? Because I've definitely had that issue. Um, yeah. I've had patients get upset, like, oh, you left something you know, inside because they'll see something later on pop out. I'm like, oh, I didn't want to leave that. But with a 6-0 proline, so I've actually considered changing to a far, far near, near just to see if that, you know, makes it a little easier to remove. I, I don't, you know, we'll see. <laughs> the best thing I found, so I used to have, at least for the people I do vertical mattress sutures on, I found, first of all, if I'm the one that takes them out because I found if I... You know, usually our nurses or our MAs will do it and they usually do a good job, but, but, you know, those sutures tend to be harder. And so yeah. one of the things I found, and I try to teach people this, but it's kind of hard to, to do unless you've done a lot of them is, is if you take the iris scissors and you, when you go through, as long as you have, you should have a couple of millimeters between your, your near and near and your far, far suture. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of feel it catch when you get to your, your first knot, you know, underneath the knot. Mm-hmm. And so if you just cut that first one, then usually you can pull it and it will come out right. in, in one piece. And so you can, even with the 6 um, I've been able to usually get that, especially because initially, you know, when you inject all the local and things like that, it's a little more swollen. So inevitably it's not as much tension when you're, when you're taking them out as actually right. initially when you place them. And so, you know, occasionally you'll still get a strand here or there that you might have to go back some yeah. time and take out. It's but, just that usually, some patients get so upset. They just think like you just, fail them if any suture is left behind but obviously as we know it's not a big deal and you can always get it out you know in the future it's not going to hurt them all right excellent and then what about earlobe reduction who qualifies for that and where are the incisions placed for for that type of procedure so usually uh you know for that it tends to be older patients just because those tend to be the patients that have kind of lost some skin elasticity lost some volume and so of course as that happens, you tend to get some elongation of, of the earlobe itself. And so really anyone that, uh, you know, one of the things I look for is hopefully not a keloid former, especially with the ear. You know, people that are more prone to keloids, the ears tend to be, unfortunately, one of the higher sites of keloid formation. So although it's not an absolute contraindication, it's certainly something to talk about because there's, there's certainly a chance with any type of incision that they could form a keloid and they may be more unhappy with the keloid than what they had to begin with. You know, non-surgically, sometimes depending on the how much elongation they have, filler is a good option, a good non-surgical option that I've done because they restore some of the volume. And actually, when you restore some of the volume, you actually get a little bit of lift in the mm-hmm. earlobe. I mean, it's not it's which not filler, which, which filler do you recommend in that location? Uh, usually, I do uh, Juvederm, okay. you know, typical Juvederm. You can use, I've had some people use Voluma uh, okay. over there, a little bit longer lasting. But, yeah. um, you know, Juvederm tends to work pretty well. Right. You know, surgically, I tend to put my incision kind of right along the crease, the natural lower portion of the ear. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it forms. So sometimes I'll do them in conjunction with like a slot ear deformity or a tear. So your scars kind of look a little T basically. Okay. If you're just doing the earlobe reduction, I do it kind of along the lower portion. And one of the keys, um, actually I learned in fellowship, was to mm-hmm. one of the keys to get it to look natural is to really bevel your, your incision. So you don't want it to be perpendicular because when you try to approximate that, you're going to really have kind of a, it's going to kind of be like a really poochy looking mm-hmm. incision. It's not going to look natural. So you want to kind of, kind of bevel it so that when you put it together, it forms a nice, nat- like a nice recreates the natural curve of the mm-hmm. low portion of the earlobe. And so uh, same thing, sutures in for about a week. And then usually after a week, we can, can take them out. And usually I use the vertical mattress as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, perfect. And then one of the more common types of 
ear aesthetic surgeries is uh, ear pinning or otoplasty. And there are many ways of doing it. Um, I guess first, like, again, who's a good candidate? And maybe if you can lay out all the different repair uh, sort of options and um, just generally how you do it under, is it under local anesthesia or general? And does it depend on age for that? Or, you know, just go ahead and tell sure. us how you do it. <laughs> um, yeah, the things that I look for. So one of the things is, is determining if it's a, we call it deformity versus like a malformation. So deformity is, is when you have all the natural cartilage, but it's not shaped maybe the way that you'd like it to be, or, or there's what we call deformation of the cartilage. A malformation is when there's actually their skin or cartilage or sometimes both miss, missing. And so the conditions like necrotia, for example, would be something that would be associated with that. Because there's different treatments and it really determines a little bit of overlap to some degree, but generally speaking, you know, deformation are treated differently than the malformation. So for deformation so it really some of it depends on when the patient comes in so if they come in you know i've seen patients literally newborns or you know a week or two out you know they will come in with some ear deformations and you know, we have a option called ear molding where you can actually put a mold and actually mold the cartilage the way you like it to be and because the maternal estrogen levels are are high enough um, usually in the first six weeks of life um, we think that that estrogen level actually allows the cartilage to be malleable and to actually you can mold it and actually have it stay that way. And the success rate actually is pretty high. Um, it's about 90% as far as not needing or wanting any further procedures down the line. And so you can't correct everything. So you can't do microtia, for example. So, so as long as you actually have the cartilage there, you can kind of shape it how you'd like it to shape it. But if it's not, then, then that kind of patient would not be a good candidate for your molding. Now, if they come later, like around, you know, typically the cutoff I use is about three months. So, if they present later than three months, then ear molding is usually not a good option because it's not going to usually not going to work. And so at that point, then we're thinking more along the lines of surgery. Typically, we want to try to do surgery before they get to school, so before kindergarten, so around four, four to five years of age. There are some surgeons that will do it earlier, but the other thing to consider is usually the ears is about 80, 85 percent of adult size around that time, so you can kind of get a good idea of what what it's going to look like. Whereas the earlier you do it, the smaller it is, and there still may be some things that that will change. You can do it at any point. So it's not like you have to do it four to five years of sure. age, but there's actually some good studies that will show, you know, the psychological benefit that patients get from, from not having that social stigma, you know, throughout yeah. the school age. And so certainly, you know, I do think it has a good benefit, uh, you know, for that, but you, know, you can do it really at any point. And there's, there's lots of surgical you know, techniques. There's cartilage, we call cartilage sparing. So we don't actually cut the cartilage, but you use kind of sutures to kind of hold things mm -hmm. in place. There's what we call incisionless, where you don't actually, traditionally you make an incision behind the ear, but with incisionless, uh, you don't actually make the incision, but you still use sutures to kind of hold things uh, in place. And then there's you know, uh, cartilage cutting or cartilage scoring you know, techniques, mm -hmm. which actually cut to the cartilage. And there's really not one technique. There's not one that's superior to another. There's there's pros and cons to all of them. And yeah. some of it's based on training. Some of it's based on what kind of malformation or deformity the, the patient has, um, yeah. which ones are you know good for them. But, you know, the things that I look for in patients, you know, again, how their wound healing is, making sure they're not keloid formers. Yeah, you know, I think a good thing is also realistic expectations. So kind of like we talked about earlier, making sure they understand that really the goal is improvement. You know, we probably want to try to get, hopefully they'll be perfect and maybe it'll be symmetric, but you know, because there's a lot of factors that are unfortunately out of our control, you know, how scar tissue heals and, you know, some of it's just lifestyle. If they're, if they're a boxer, for example, then, you know, their ears are going to be different than, you know, someone that's maybe not going to go on, you know, do boxing. Sure, so, sure. so, you know, all those things kind of come into play. And that's, that's really why that first visit with them to kind of explain those types of things was, was really important. Yeah, no, thanks for kind of giving us an awesome overview there. Um, so what about the folks who say, I want the ear completely as flat to the head as possible? Is that a good look? Is that something that you kind of will do if that's what they really want? Or is it okay to have some degree of like tilt off of your head? You want to have a natural look, you really want some degree. So you actually can take measurements. So at the soup, we call the superior helix at the top part of the ear, you, know, you want about 13 millimeters or so at the center portion around the external auditory canal, auditory canal you want about 16 millimeters and then the lobule or sorry 18 in the at the external canal and about 16 millimeters then at the lobule so that's kind of a good rule of thumb you know if you have it kind of stuck to the 
to the head, you know, really doesn't look natural. Um, and it really will attract kind of people's attention. I actually had one patient who's, he had prominent ears and his worry was his whole family had that and he did want them in some, but he didn't want it. He actually really didn't want them stuck. And so we kind of, you know, I showed him kind of what I thought it would look like kind of a, as a good natural position. And actually for him, he thought it was too much and he actually wanted it less. So I actually undercorrected him a little bit just based again, kind of on his preference. And that's why, you know, again, it really is important to determine what the patient you know, wants because the quote unquote, you know, norms or the textbook numbers are just kind of guidelines. It really just comes out to, you know, sense of taste. Yeah. Yeah. And I tell some patients also that if you completely remove, you know, a lot of this cartilage, yeah, you'll get like a really floppy ear that you can do anything with and it's not going to protrude, but you want to maintain some degree of naturalness, the actual, you know, respect the, the curvature, the natural curvature and, you know, landmarks of the ear. So that's right. the other thing I find that, you know, even in some of our, you know, at the conferences where they'll show some before and afters and, and you can tell like just that the integrity of the ear has been sort of destroyed and right. yeah, then you can pin it however you want. But if you want it to also just look like an ear, you'll have to accept that the cartilage will have some degree of memory and might bounce back. I, don't, that, I mean, that's what I try to explain to them. Yeah, that's the way to put it. And you have to look out for their barbers too. You know, the barbers are probably going to like you very much if their ears sticking to their head because you know, you're trying to get a haircut. That's right. <laughs> it's going to be right. impossible. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, and then in terms of uh, common complications that you see, you know, what, what types of things do people need to watch out for? Yeah, probably the most serious one. Fortunately, it's not very common, but usually it's not a very painful procedure. And so pain in the first few days, extreme pain in the first few days is a sign that something's not right. You know, one of the things we look out for is called the hematoma or blood collection. So, you know, especially with the ear, the cartilage blood supplies from the skin. And, you know, when we do this, depending on the technique we use, when you do the surgery, oftentimes you lift the skin off the cartilage. And so there's always potential blood can form in that space. And if it's not addressed, then sometimes the cartilage could potentially die, um, which is what happens in things like, you know, cauliflower ears you'll see in wrestlers and things like that if they're not addressed. You know, infection certainly can, can happen early on. You know, keloids, you know, occasionally can pop up, you know, sutures sometimes can form little granulomas or, or extrude, you know, late complications that we'll sometimes see, you know, loss of corrections you kind of already talked about over time, things can sometimes kind of protrude back out. Yeah. Sometimes patients will get either paresthesias, like little numbness or kind of shooting pain near the incision or even sometimes some hypersensitivity to cold. But fortunately, almost all those things are pretty, are pretty rare, you know, we don't see them them very often. And a lot of those things, as long as we catch them early, even with hematomas and things like that, yeah. they're treatable and usually don't affect the, the final result as long as they're addressed properly. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing you know, more of these in my practice and textbook you know, teachings are that if you have the pain, you have to bring them right back and look at it. Right. And I've had that a couple of times now where, you know, patients been complaining of pain, it seems like it's asymmetric. So I bring them in and it's fine. So yeah. I mean, I think in the first few days, there's definitely, a, you know, some degree of discomfort. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't know, like the, the textbook, what they, what they tell us to like be on the lookout for. Um, I've just found that a lot of patients have some pain and it's not always the same from side to side. So. What I found it'd be helpful is I usually put a, a headdressing on, like a, almost like a master dressing afterwards. And I always have them come back to the office the next day to remove it in my office. So that way I'm going to see them anyway on post-op day one, if there's anything like a hematoma, you know, usually it's going to pop up in the first 24 hours or so unless yeah. they hit their ear or something. And so you can see it, you can address it, you know, it's, I mean, it can happen later on, but it's not as likely. So usually if you're going to see them the next day, you're going to check it and make sure and if everything looks good, then, you know, the chance of them having something else pop up is, is relatively small. Yeah, that's a great way to do things. I usually do it within like the first 48 hours as well. Another little trick I picked up at a meeting was that um, if you leave the posterior incision, I mean, if you're doing this procedure with incisions, um, you can mm -hmm. leave it partially open to basically just allow it to drain. I mean, the incision will still heal fine. And right. uh, you just, you know, some of that blood can escape. So, no, that's all, all great material. So we talked about ear molding. Anything else that you want to add to that about ear molding? Or do you feel like you covered yeah. it? I think probably the most important thing because it's so time sensitive is really educating, you know, the pediatricians. I found actually when I gave a talk to, to them and that helped because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them may not know what to look for, number one, and they may not know that there are options. You know, ear molding yeah. something in the last five, 10 years has become more 
still not something that everyone does, but it's become more prevalent and certainly mm-hmm. acceptable, but a lot of people still don't know about it. And so, you know, I've had patients that will go to, I'm actually on one of the, the websites for one of the ear molding companies and they'll find me through that. They'll look for ear molding, you know, aside from the referral. So I think the biggest thing is catching it because if you know, the patient comes in your past three months, you know, unfortunately there's, there's just not much you can do. So a lot of it really is, is, you know, finding, catching them early. And as long as it's something that can be addressed, which actually a lot of the ear deformities mm-hmm. can be through ear molding, you can often potentially avoid anything surgical. And the other thing with ear molding, it actually is often covered by insurance, which for, almost all the stuff we're talking yeah, about is usually, usually not, but, but insurance companies usually cover the ear molding, which is kind of unique. So um, again, it's something that we can, we can do to kind of help people. And it's relatively minimally invasive. Right. And so for parents, I know, you know, you said that pediatricians sometimes don't even look for it, but what about like for parents, uh, what sort of signs would they be looking for um, with the ears? So um, certainly ears, you know, the ears sticking out is probably the most common deformity or, you know, lack of what we call antihelical fold uh, here. There's even, you know, what's called stall's ear, which is kind of like the Spock ear. There's uh, what we call uh, like a hooding or, or where the top helix kind of kind of hoods over the ear. So the ears kind of flopped over. So any kind of abnormal fold in the ear. And then even cryptosha, where actually the cartilage is actually buried underneath the scalp. Actually, that can be corrected even with, with ear molding as mm-hmm. well. So really just anything that kind of doesn't look quote unquote normal. Yeah. Got it. Is there anything else you want to add to incisionless otoplasty? Something that I don't uh, typically offer in my practice, but have you had some good success with that? Yeah. For the patient that really wants minimal downtime, you know, the incisional otoplasty, it's a suture technique. So the main difference between the traditional otoplasty and that is that you don't make the incision behind the ear and you use the suture mm-hmm. to actually make the changes that you're trying, same kind of suture that you would do normally just without the incision. And then usually you do a little bit of cartilage scoring along with that as well. The nice thing with that, there's really minimal uh, hematoma risk because you're not mm-hmm. lifting the skin off of the, of the cartilage. And so the downtime really is, is pretty minimal. You know, the, I'd say the downside to it, you know, I think there's a little bit higher chance of loss of correction with that because you're not doing quite as much as far as you're know, moving skin and things like that. And, but the trade-off is, again, there's less downtime, usually less pain associated with it. And so it is, again, for the right patient, I mean, the right malformation, because there's mm-hmm. only certain things you can do with it. But for the right patient, uh, you know, certainly it's a good option for, for them. Yeah, yeah, good point. I don't want to get too deep into microtia since it's a, it's a huge topic. Are you doing yeah. any microtia repairs in your practice now? Uh, no, I don't do any just because, you know, you really need kind of a children's hospital yeah. uh, set up. So, you know, unless you're at a kind of a specialized center, you know, those are the time tend to be the place, but, but I don't personally do them. Yeah. And the other big thing is that with microtia, it's like you either do a huge operation that usually has multiple stages and requires right. rib cartilage and all that, or you just get a prosthesis that will look better than any reconstruction that we can do. Right. I mean, that's right. Yeah, that's kind of the dilemma that I've always uh, found interesting. And I think if it was my kid, like, I'd seriously consider opting for the prosthesis. Yeah, I mean, the prosthetics nowadays, I mean, they, they look real. I mean, you can't tell. I mean, yeah. the main disadvantage is, I mean, you have to put them on and so people can get kind of like adhesive reactions and things, you know, on the on the skin with some of these. But as far as cosmetic appearance, I mean, I, I mean, there's many people that get good results with, with traditional microtia surgical repairs, but... You know, the prosthesis really are, are give you a nice result. You know, the one thing about the microtias or the surgical repair is it kind of, you know, some people say it kind of either grows with the kid or kind of adapts with, with the kid because it, I mean, it's natural tissue. And although it's not quote unquote really growing, but it is, right. it is obviously alive. And so it does, you know, there's relatively little maintenance once, once you're recovered from it. So obviously you're not taking it off and putting it on every day and you don't have tissue reactions and things like that. But you know, the, with the prosthesis today, I mean, especially if you don't want to go through between two to four operations, you know, I, I don't think you necessarily would go wrong, you know, with a, a good prosthesis. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then for people who may not know what microtia is, we had a question, like, what is microtia? Uh, what's mm-hmm. the best way, I think, to describe that, you know, just in layman's terms? So microtia is when you're actually missing either a combination of skin and or cartilage uh, from the ear. So you can have there's different grades of it. Um, so you can have all the way from relatively minimal cosmetic you know, change 
all the way to complete no ear uh, called anosia. And oftentimes it's associated with inner ear deformities. So there's can be hearing loss or, or other um, balance issues kind of associated with it. So anytime you see microtia, usually you want to work them up for other potential inner ear malformations. But um, you know, the repair and force, because you're missing material, you know, basically you kind of replace like with like. So you have to get it from somewhere else. So the surgical repair that's much more uh, involved usually than kind of what we were talking about before with the autoplasty type of thing. Those things don't really apply to microtia kind of repair, but basically it's when you see people that are actually missing portions of the year. Yeah, no, that's a great way to explain it. And then let's finish up with this uh, Spock ear or elf ear surgery that some people are looking for. It's like, I guess it falls under like the body modification. Um, certain yeah. websites, when I Googled it, they were like, like, yeah, you can like go to like a, a certified like body modification specialist or a plastic surgeon. Uh, I find that really bizarre. I yeah. haven't had anyone request that in my practice. I, I don't know if you've run into it. Any uh, patients? Not yet. No. no. Usually they're trying to get me to, to fix that, to get away from that. But yeah, it's, again, I mean, to some degree, I guess we cater to what patients want. It may not necessarily be something that we would personally want, but you know, to some degree, I guess you can carry that. But the one thing I would caveat, you know, some of the people that are going through bigger changes is make sure it's not like a run of the mill decision. It's not something they're just deciding, you know, that day, because, you know, those changes are not reversible. And so, you know, it will never look like a normal year again, if they decide that they don't like it and want to go back to kind of how it was. And so, you know, for those patients, I'd really caution them to make sure that they kind of know what they're getting into and that they really want to to do this. And you know, I've seen some case reports of people having problems, like they can't sleep on that ear afterwards. It's so sensitive um, after procedures like that. And so, and you're kind of doing the opposite. You know, a lot of what we do is to try and make people um, hopefully feel less self-conscious and kind of quote unquote more towards the social norm. And so with this, you're kind of going the opposite way. And so, I mean, if that's what the patient wants, you know, that's one thing, but you just want to make sure they kind of understand that their ear is not going to look like other people's ears. So it's going to attract attention as, as opposed to kind of distract or not or not attract attention. So it's kind of a little bit different mindset, I guess. Yeah. You know, with that no, you're thing. right. I think with like the whole body mods movement, those are some of the same people who get like, you know, piercings and other things. Uh, in a way, I guess it is, like you said, to attract attention um, rather than to kind of blend in and one of the best lines I've ever heard about plastic surgery was that you know, plastic surgery shouldn't scream, it should whisper. You know, and I think right. like you and I, you know, we basically uh, yeah, emulate that in our practices. But yeah, you're right. Like this is the exact opposite. It's it's like someone who puts in, I don't know, like like very large breast implants on all of their patients. And, um, right. you know, that's that's really not how most plastic surgeons like to practice. And um, or the types of patients that we want to attract into our practices. But, but you know, it's out there and, and people might be looking for it and maybe they have a great reason why they want that. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Maybe they'll become more the norm. Yeah. You, you never, never know. know. Yeah. Star Trek is a, is a popular thing. So. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, cool. So anything else that you want to add, Dave, about uh, ear aesthetics? No, I think we covered... Uh... You know, a lot. I think I'd encourage you know anyone that's considering this. I mean, it's a you know, from a surgeon, it's definitely very rewarding. You know, uh, I think especially you know in kids, it it gives them a lot of uh, and the parents too. It gives them a lot of confidence, and uh, it really takes kind of a big worry away. And so I you know I think it is really gratifying to do both you know as a surgeon and certainly seeing kind of the the effects for that. And you know even for ear molding, same way. You know even you know great. I'm a surgeon. I, I love to do surgery, but if I can do something and prevent someone from having to kind of go through something you know, down the line. Certainly I'm happy to, to do that, but, you know, certainly if there's any question, I think finding someone that's, certainly that's experienced in this and, and getting their opinion doesn't hurt to, to go in and see what they say. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I know you're the same way. I'm very honest with patients. If I think it's something, you know, that I can't do or that I think is going to, they're going to be happy with, you know, I, I tell them, I don't just operate anyone that, that kind of walks through the door. And, you know, I think a, a big portion of this, obviously it's patient selection and making sure you're going to, you know, make them happy. I mean, that's our goal is to really help our patients and improve their quality of life, you know, with, with any of these things that we do. Exactly. Yeah. Well said. So Dave, how do people find you if they want to learn more about your molding or any of the other ear procedures you've mentioned? Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? 
Um, so I'm not an advocate, so you can uh, uh, call our office, 630-859-8700. Uh, um, you know, we have our website as well. Um, you can just schedule electronic appointments. Um, and uh, you know, now with the pandemic, hopefully improving, you know, we're starting to see patients again. So, um, you know, certainly I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone you know, has anything else. Yeah, perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining me. And thank you. Thanks, thanks for so having much. Me. Bye. Bye.